There's violent confrontation between police and members of the public happening every hour in the United States. And that is due to the lack of understanding and how to communicate with each other effectively. So joining us here in studio today, we have Sergeant Jason Lehman, who will be clarifying and talking about his nonprofit organization, Why You Stop Me, who you and your team are on a mission to really provide better communication understanding efforts between police and members of the public. Thank you for joining us here today. How are you? Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm having a time of my life. Excited to be here. I, it's amazing. I mean, I've been reading about your organization. So tell me a little bit, because you've been part of the Long Beach Police Department since 2006. So tell us a little bit about your journey as to becoming, being a police here and serving for the community and then founding the Why Do You Stop Me organization. How did that come about? Sure. So in 2006, I got hired to be a police officer, and it was one of the best days of my life to find out that I was going to be able to protect the community that needed protectors. And all of our communities need law enforcement officers. But uh, it took me some time to realize the type of law enforcement officers that community members need. And that's one of the things that Why'd You Stop Me really covers. I started in 2006, I worked patrol for a few years, and then I got onto a gang and violent crime suppression team called Directed Enforcement. And I worked in the West Division of Long Beach. I got myself into a number of uses of force, violent incidences where um, myself and other police officers um, had to use force to overcome resistance or take somebody into custody. And that was never fun. And I started thinking to myself, what is it that could be done differently to allow us to better understand one another and to take the idea of stop resisting or you must comply and put those in terms that the community better understands. So um, because of some incidents that I got into, um, some of them very serious, I, I, it led me into a classroom. And in this classroom, I started speaking to a group of kids. And this, this group of future leaders, um, I sat there for about an hour, and I told them my struggles with power and my struggles with fear. At the time, I didn't realize that's what I was speaking about. I was just having a conversation with them. But in this school, the administrator that brought these kids in referred to these kids back then as some of the kids that were struggling or perhaps what people would call the bad kids. I have come to the idea now that there are no bad youth. There's just children that are making bad decisions based off of most of the time misunderstandings. So when I walked out of that classroom after an hour, I had made an impact. But I realized my impact uh, later on. My realization started when at the end of the class, one of the kids raised their hand and he wanted to say something. So uh, they call me Tiny in Long Beach. That's one of my nicknames. <laughs> and um, when we were speaking with the youth um, and this, this young man raised his hand, he stood up and in the back of the room, he said, hey, Tiny, um, I got something to tell you. And what he told me blew my mind. It took me years to process what he told me, actually. But he said, hey, two years ago, you arrested me with a gun in my waistband. It was raining that day, and I was with my girlfriend. Now, at the time I was speaking to this kid, I believe he was 17 years old. So this is a 15-year-old that I arrested with a gun in his waistband. I can be fairly positive that I pointed a gun at him because he had a gun. And that's part of what we do in our techniques and the way that we were safe. And I made him crawl to me. And he said, you made me crawl to me? And he used a couple expletives that I'm not going to use, but he said, you dropped your big knee in my back. You handcuffed me and somebody else scooped me up and pulled me away. And this is the first moment I've seen you since then. He said, this hour was the first hour you explained to us and to me why you did what you did. I never knew it. I never knew you put your knee on my back so I couldn't roll over because I was a threat. I never knew you made me crawl because you wanted to take me off my feet so I couldn't run away or possibly reach for that firearm. But now, through this training, I know, and I can make you a promise. He said, myself and everybody in this room will never hurt you or another Long Beach police officer because of the conversation we had today. And I was mind blown. So I walked out. The assistant principal at the time said, what's the name of your program? I said, I don't have a program. I'm just talking to some kids. Right? I'm going back to doing police work. Right? And uh, at that time, I thought, you know, guns, drugs, bad guys. That's police work. But police work is so much more. And the evolution of police work is something that a lot of us don't really get to see unless we're police officers ourselves. So I said, hey, you know what? I don't have a name for the program. He said, hey, we got this new website thing. This is back in December of 2000. 
um, around December of 2011. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, give me something for the website. I said, okay, well, they always want to know why they got stopped. So call it, why'd you stop me? Okay. I had absolutely no clue what to call it. And from then, we shortened it to an acronym called WISM. And our team is Team WISM. And so Team WISM now travels around and it was formed as police officers or a police officer that was teaching people. Then we learn that it's hard to listen to a police officer, especially if you've never been one. It's hard to see past the uniform. That universal uniform is something that disconnects us sometimes. And that's unfortunate. So what I did was I brought in a team of community champions. And these community champions are, for the most part, justice system involved ex-felons. But those are defining terms that we don't use. And that's why we call them community champions. So the fact they've had encounters with the law really helps to be able to show the other side or the 360 or the 180 of, of what we do, which creates this full 360 degree approach of learning. Because if you don't listen to the big bald white guy, you might listen to the other person that I bring in, who's typically um, a person of color, um, a person of a different gender, perfect person that believes and thinks a little bit differently from me and might believe and think a little bit closer to the people that we're trying to impact. So police officers may want to listen to me. Community members may want to listen to my partner, who's a community member. And it really allows for um, this full engagement of learning. So that's how things got started. We started off in classrooms in high schools in Long Beach. And now um, we've operated in about 20 cities in five different states with the, with the um, nonprofit aspect of our work occurring solely here in Long Beach. That's highly fascinating. Was an organ type of organization I've never really come across. Wisdom, how have you seen it have an impact on people other than that initial, let's say, pivotal moment of sure. that guy coming up to you? In what forms have you seen it expand mm -hmm. and people like actually noticing the difference? Sure. So we've been so fortunate. We did a two year longitudinal study working with the Board of State and Community Corrections on a grant called Impl Improving Police and Community Trust. And during that grant, we were able to take a, uh, we were able to take a sample group of the Salinas and Monterey County communities and put them through our training and follow them for a two year period. We did that not only with the community members, but we trained every patrol officer in the Salinas Police Department and every patrol officer in the Monterey County Sheriff's Department to be able to see the change. And we followed ideas like um, by asking community members, are police brutal? And then saying, do you feel that police are still brutal? Do you feel the police have a need to be in the community? And then are police officers still in the community? Um, do, you, do you still see a need, right? And, and those, those differences um, were measured. And then on the police side, police officers were able to admit that they saw greater value in community policing. They saw greater value in getting out of their police car in a time where, unfortunately, uh, members and aspects of our community have created systems that, that make police officers feel like it's harder to do policing. And that concept is sometimes called de-policing. And we are trying to battle de-policing because we want police officers to get out of their car, shoot hoops with kids. We want them to enforce laws that need to be enforced, but we want them to be just in doing that. We want them to take just 120 seconds to make an impact and teach somebody how they want to be treated. So we take this idea of community policing and we bring it to educational policing. Mm -hmm. Direct um, translation from our program into the field is something that is, is really just amazing to me. What happens for me is we are able to sit there and we're able to look at this and say, hey, we have the opportunity for us to tell somebody how to cooperate with the police and also for us to have somebody feel empowered that they have a, um, a say in the administrative process if a police officer did something wrong to get that police officer retrained or something like that. So we have a system in place where we teach community members the ABCs of going through a stop and being contacted, right? What's the importance of putting up your hands? Why do police officers maybe squeeze your fingers before they search you? Why, why do you get handcuffed? Why are you asked to lay down on the ground, right? Some of these apparently demoralizing things, why do police officers do that? And by doing that, we have a direct translation to seeing people that are more cooperative in the field. Now, we have a 13-year-old named Ernest, and we're going to highlight Ernest tomorrow during our scholarship awards ceremony. Um, and Ernest is a person who's from San Jose. We did some great work in San Jose through, through their mayor's gang task force. 
And Ernest went through our program. And in the beginning of the program, he literally stood up five minutes into the program and at 13 said, F the police. He was somebody that had never been taught why we should cooperate with law enforcement. So at the end of the program, Ernest says, you know what? The police are good. I didn't know this. Um, we need the police. And I felt really good about that. A year later, we got a call from a San Jose Police Department a police officer. And he told us, you know, I got to call you, he told me, Officer Lehman, I got to call you and I got to thank you because um, Ernest did something great. But before I do that, I have good news and I have bad news about Ernest. And so here I was worried, trying to figure out what it was. And he told me that the bad news was he had just located Ernest with a loaded nine millimeter handgun in his waistband. And to me, that's not okay. It's a criminal act. And um, he said, but the good news is he was the most cooperative young man I have ever encountered in my life. And when I asked him why he put his hands up, why he told me he had a gun in his waistband, why he said it's not for you, why he articulated that it was nothing personal towards the police officer, he said it was because some big ball white guy from Long Beach had taught him how to cooperate with the police. And those are the stories that we know are happening on a day-to-day -day basis with the people that we're teaching on how to do it. On the flip side, police officers have, have, a, have a part in this. And police officers and our police officer training is something that we're really proud to be able to provide uh, as well. A couple of questions strike me here as we're going along the story. It's highly fascinating. It's, you know, we do, I mean, I guess, Ernest, as an example, how he said, F the police in the beginning. I mean, there's so much that is exposed in the media when it comes to policing and how people fear certain aspects, certain case scenarios. And so why do you think this country hasn't done such a great job when it comes to uh, both finding a common ground, you mm -hmm. know, so both, both, you know, members of the public who are feeling judged or are going to be arrested? Um, and why people may follow in that path. Why, why do you think this, this country m may not be, let's say, um, at the forefront in ha handling such situations in the best way sometimes? Sure. Well, I'm going to start off by saying that our organization is very proud to do something called deleting the universal. When we start off, when we explain, ask police officers if the media is hurting the police. And police officers will often raise their hand and say, yes, the media is hurting police community relations. But how does that make you feel as a member of the media? It doesn't make you feel good, I would guess. Right? Well, it's often, you know, of course, there are certain things that are exposed and you can see them being exposed in its real and raw form. Mm -hmm. But then there's also other things that can be highly emphasized versus mm -hmm. other things that can be not, not so presented so much in the media. Yes, sure. that's always a discourse in yeah. the media and it's always an issue. But let's say the realities and facts of what people do see and that's why you have a 13-year-old who's like, F the police, there must be something there and why do you think that is then? So I'm, so I'm trying to, yeah, I'm, and as I get there, the idea is I've created my idea about a few media pieces and so now I say the media does this. That's a universal. Police officers sometimes have a tendency to want to create universals in their head. If I go to the intersection, this certain intersection, every time I've gone, I've dealt with gang members, drug addicts, people experiencing homelessness. So the next time I go, I'm going to deal with a gang member, a drug, a drug dealer, a person experiencing homelessness. Well, that's not fair. I got to give a fair shake to the next time I show up. And I got to say, I don't know who I'm going to encounter. These people have, but I don't know. And so police officers are working to try and overcome this concept of implicit bias, mm -hmm. which happens in all human beings. But it takes training to understand that. And the training that we provide allows us to understand it. Why do I think that some aspects of the social media, not all of them, but some aspects and some articles and some pieces of social media are hurting us um, and why we see this divide between police and the community? It's because we haven't had the education. So. Force science plays a big part in this. Force science explains to us the concept of a traffic accident. So we follow, we learn when we test for the police, uh, for the uh, driving test, we learn to follow three, we leave three car lengths, right? And most of us leave about two, right? And sometimes it's, it's one, yeah, and sometimes <laughs> it's even one. But yet we still have fender benders. And we have those fender benders, even though we see the person and they, we see their stoplights, do we sometimes run into them? Yeah, we do. Well, that if we were to video record that and we were to watch it, 
we would be watching it and we would say, there's no way that this car could have kept going and run into the back of that other car. They should have stopped. Mm -hmm. We'd be watching that, right? We'd be watching it in real time, in real video, and we'd be going, that's ridiculous. That car should have put their brakes on. But the person inside the car is saying, I didn't react in time to this action. I didn't react in time and I hit the car, but I meant to stop the car. I just took three quarters of a second to react, to see the brake lights. And then I took three quarters of a second to press the brakes, which is the way our brain functions, right? A normally functioning brain responds 1.5 seconds behind in a function and in, in the action of reaction. It's called the reactionary gap. Mm -hmm. Well, that reactionary gap happens during police community conflict and police community contacts. So if a police officer draws their gun and they draw their firearm and they see a threat and that threat is unfortunately a deadly threat, which means that if not stopped right now, the person has a chance to inflict great bodily harm or death upon somebody, a police officer, a member of the community, and that police officer decides to pull the trigger. That reactionary gap still exists. It takes the police officer about 1.5 seconds to decide to pull the trigger and then that police officer starts pulling the trigger. Well, how do they tell themselves to turn off and stop pulling the trigger? The exact same way, through a reactionary gap. So then it takes 1.5 seconds for that police officer to stop doing that. Now, these are average numbers. It could change based off of a number of different factors. But if I pull the trigger once, and I'm going to say in my head as a police officer, I am going to use deadly force until that threat is stopped, right? Which will make sense. If somebody's shooting at me, I'm going to shoot until they... Stop shooting, put the gun down, right? okay. whatever it is, it's going to take me 1.5 seconds to stop that. So that time is going to, could in essence be six more, six more pulls of a trigger. A trigger pull is once every quarter of a second. And now I'm pulling the trigger six more times. That person's already fallen to the ground, but my brain hasn't turned, hasn't turned off for lack of better terms. It hasn't turned to tell my muscle memory to stop pulling the trigger. And now we have this brutal shooting. That's real time video, six extra shots in real time video. And because aspects of our community, including certain members of the media don't have that training, they put that picture up there and it's real. It happened, but it's what, what's missing on that is the fact that our brain couldn't function fast enough to stop shooting, so now we have excessive visible The whole internal shooting. dialogue and external goes behind every scenario. So going back to, the, let's say, that point in case of um, the active response. Mm -hmm. So what, what your organization does. So people might not have the active to have you come in and do mm -hmm. the workshop and learn some of the tactics. What are a couple of tips that you can share that for the police and even for like members of the public, for them like Ernest himself who had this revolver and then was able to communicate with the police, what were some of the tactics that you can share sure, for people sure. to learn a little bit? Yeah, so on the community side, so if we were training the community, now we train police officers and community members in six different comprehensive trainings that are scenario involved in nature, empowering and are captivating to be able to understand that we reestablish the fact that we're going to pay attention every seven seconds. And so if we can't keep you captivated, we're going to have to make a change. So as we go on and as we do this, what we have to understand is we have to understand what's going to make sense to a community member, right? Training changes behavior. If not, it's just a waste of time in a classroom. And so what we want to do is we want to make people better. Well, how do we make community members better? We explain that fear is the root of all acts of violence. So the less scared we are of the police, the less acts of violence we'll have, point blank and period, proven scientifically time in and time out. So how do we do that? We say, hey, these are the reasons why you should trust a person in a uniform. About 99% of them are good. One, maybe 2% of them shouldn't be police officers. They need to be fired. Some of them need to be put in prison. And unfortunately, that's how it is in every profession. But the majority of the police officers in this country, the majority of the 800,000 protectors are good. So when we see the good and we're not as scared, we have a greater opportunity to respect and to listen. We don't have to like, but to respect and to listen. So if we respect and we listen, that means we would do what the police officers asked of us during the contact. The way that we get community members to understand the importance of doing that is by giving them an avenue to make a change. And to, the avenue to make a change is the reporting in the internal and external affairs reporting systems. So in Long Beach, we have an internal affairs system and we have the CPCC, the Citizens Police Complaint Commission. 
Both of those work to make sure that police misconduct is exposed. They both work to make sure that police officers get retrained if they're doing something wrong or get fired if they've done something very wrong. And most police officers are in complete agreement with that and we embrace that. As a, and so the, I, the general idea is not the idea of compliance. It's the idea of cooperation, mm -hmm. feeling empowered to cooperate and knowing something good is going to come out of that. So there's a step-by-step -step process that we have. But what I would tell the community is, and it sounds weighing because it's hard to articulate this. It sounds like I'm going to say, do everything the cop says. But the truth is, if you cooperate with the law enforcement, with law enforcement, you listen to what they ask you to do, you're typically going to be safe through the contact. You can affect an impact change by reporting that misconduct immediately through a number of different channels. And all of those channels for the Long Beach Police Department exist on the website, www.longbeach.gov forward slash police. You can report misconduct right there. On the police side, which I feel is as important, police officers have to see the value to them. What's in it for me? in community policing. And what's in it for police officers is if we can be kind and fair, if we can be, um, if we can be honest and transparent in what we do during this contact, the contact between me and you, then the next contact, you're going to see the person that I represent as more human. You're going to have a greater opportunity to want to listen. You're going to have more respect. You're going to have less fear. You're going to be more kind in return to the police officer. And so that improves officer safety. It makes a safer contact next time. So we have 12 tips for police officers through our California Post Certified Procedural Justice Training that allows police officers the necessary information to take 120 seconds and impact somebody's life, teach them something about how we want to be treated. So on the next call for service or the next contact, if that ever happens, God forbid, that police officer is seen differently through the eyes okay. of the community member. Well, talk, talking about kind and fairness, you're obviously um, highlighting youths. As I understand, mm -hmm. tomorrow you yes. have a very special event going on, the Youth for Youth Scholarship Award Ceremony. Power for Powers. Power for, sorry. That's okay. Power for youth powers. for Youth is good, too. Youth for Youth. It's Power for Powers <laughs> and Youth for Youth. Power, power for Powers Youth <laughs> there Scholarship you go. Awards. There you go. People and teaching them as to how you can better form trust and better understand each other. And so tell us a little bit about the event. What, yeah. How did that come about and why is it important? Sure. So in 2013, there was um, a very powerful lady named Claudette Jasperline Parker Powers. And Claudette came and started speaking with our organization. And she spoke at such a soft voice in classrooms where youth struggle to listen there and try and keep their attention for hours. And she would walk in for five minutes and quiet them down. And she would say two things. The first thing is she would say um, E plus Aura equals O. No way she said it. She's, that stood for event plus reaction equals outcome. Okay. It's actually become our why'd you stop me problem solving model. So throughout our training, we're able to learn how to um, learn coping mechanisms, problem solving and leadership skills, right? Well, one of our problem solving models is that E plus R equals O message, which exists on the bands mm -hmm. that we actually give out. And tomorrow, everybody will get one of these wristbands. I actually so, prefer this kind of mathematical It's easy, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah you and can so, actually better understand. It. Yeah, and we call simple. this, we, we call this the two plus two of empowerment and cooperation, mm -hmm. right? So she brought that to our organization. Um, unfortunately, in late 2013, she passed away during some complications from a surgery. Okay. And I made a promise to her family. I made a promise to Rochelle and Ellis Powers that for as long as I was alive, I was going to work my hardest to provide scholarships to youth in order to help spread the message that she wanted to message, that she wanted to spread. Because the second thing she said in this classroom is, I see greatness in you. We'd be at Cabrillo High School in front of 400 or 500 youth. And for somehow, some way, she found a way within a matter of seconds to look each one of them in the eyes and say, I see greatness in you. And we all have greatness inside of us. We're born great. And then things start happening that hurt us and hinder us. Right. And so she was really able to bring that out. So tomorrow we are going to honor her um, legacy and we are going to give youth um, one thousand dollar cash scholarships. And all they've had to do is go through and graduate from our Why'd You Stop Me program, where they make a promise and commitment to be the force multiplier. And even if you don't see Jason Lehman, you might see Andrea Hernandez. Andrea Hernandez tomorrow is going to speak about what the $1,000 cash scholarship has done for her and the fact that she now is in the, in the armed forces while also going through college. And so she's going to be able to explain how that transition has happened. But she doesn't need me. She has the tools to be able to tell her family, her friends, and anyone 
why we need to cooperate. So now they've taken this pledge to be able to be the force multiplier and the advocate for community safety and police safety. And now they, they are going to come in and they've now submitted an art submission called Life in My Streets Through My Lens. And they've done everything from um, sculptures. There is a twisting carousel of pictures of somebody's life. There wow. are essays. Um, are those going to be portrayed tomorrow? There, yeah, there'll yeah. be 10 of them. 10 finalists blasted all over the walls in the Expo Art Center in Long Beach at 4321 Atlantic. And from 6 to 8 p.m., we are going to be honored to have the vice president of, um, of UPS, Bruce McRae. Uh, Bruce Double D McRae is going to be able to come out there and be our MC. We have uh, DJ Bill Lovelace, and Bill also yes. works with Long Beach well, Local we News. So uh, he's doing some work <laughs> with, with local news. And so um, he's going to be DJing. We're going to have amazing vocals from a retired Long Beach PD gang detective, Armando Yearwood. And we'll have about 20 youth there um, to be able to honor those youth and allow them and provide them with money that's hopefully going to give them some of the books, tools, mm -hmm. and training that they need to continue their education in a more streamlined manner as long as they promise us that they are going to complete college. So we're really excited to be able to have that happen yeah. tomorrow. It's going to be a really absolutely um, amazing day. We've done this. Um, is it open it, to the public? Can they buy tickets? Or we, we, we still have. It's, it's funny. We have about 10 tickets left. Oh, so, okay. So um, how can people so find if, out? Yeah. So if we move fast, we should be able to get some tickets if they go to www.wism.org. It's W-Y-S-M.org. Mm -hmm. and then click on the link. It's a blue link that says power and then the number four powers. They click on that link, they can purchase tickets. Tickets are $50 for a single ticket, $90 for two, um, and be able to eat some good food from EJ Malloy's, be able to listen to some great music and hear our gang detective Armando Yearwood, I think I, I, I didn't finish, he is a jazz vocalist. Mm -hmm. So he's gonna be singing to us throughout the event and we'll get to better expose some of this great artwork and uh, see what life really does look like through people's lenses because that's important. So this is one of the events that brings police and the community together. Mm -hmm. So Chief Luna will be there speaking. We'll have a table of the of seven of the top leaders of the Long Beach Police Department there. Chief Nunley from the Signal Hill Police Department will be there. And we've trained members of the police department in Long Beach, and we've trained every single Signal Hill police officer to our CP21 law enforcement training. It's going to be a great, well, great what's day. What's the CP21 law enforcement training? Is that <laughs> so, another? <laughs> yeah, so the CP21 law enforcement training is the only state certified free training for law enforcement officers that's based out of procedural justice. So we have a procedural justice-based training called Community Policing in the 21st Century to Reduce Conflict. And that training allows police officers to come into a room with us for eight hours and look at some of the bias they may have, look at what implicit bias looks like, understand the importance of utilizing voice, giving a voice to, the, to our customer or to our community member that we're dealing with, understanding impartiality and decision-making understanding fairness and transparency and trust and respect building and how we do that on a call by call basis. And that's where that 120 seconds for engagement comes into play. That's where we teach police officers how to do that. Not only do we do that training, but we do very odd police training. One of the things odd. that we, very odd. Very Why odd. is it odd? Well, police officers don't typically walk into a room and practice how to give somebody a sticker. We actually practice how to take a knee and engage a youth by giving them a sticker at Starbucks and understanding the impact and the layers of the community that we impact and affect by showing our care. Because the majority of the police officers that I know really care for the community. But because of trauma, sometimes that care has gotten a little bit buried under something called cynicism. And cynicism is something all of us have. But cynicism is something we have to identify because that's what makes us a little bit negative. And, and it makes us appear a little bit negative or appear a little bit aggressive. So what we're able to do is we're able to try and overcome that cynicism, better identify our bias, which isn't going to go away, but we can overcome it, mm -hmm. right? And then better engage the community differently by doing stuff like playing sports or giving kid a sticker, volunteering our time, doing something community-based, being in the community outside of our uniform and in our plain clothes, just doing different things to be able to impact people differently. It's not just about putting somebody through a training of, hey, put your hands up and crawl to me. It's not about that. It's this full approach. And that's why I said we have these six programs. We also have a resisting arrest diversion program. And that's really something that's impactful. It's the only resisting arrest diversion program in the United States of America that partners a police officer and an ex-felon together 
to allow people to have their, their resisting arrest case completely wiped clean from their slate, like they were never arrested. And so we work with the Long Beach City Prosecutor, and we do something called pre-plea diversion. If you and I get into an incident where I have to like force your hands into handcuffs, or you lie to me for 30 minutes, or something to that extent, you're gonna get arrested for resisting arrest. That's something that happens. Unfortunately, that was a, that was a breakdown in communication between you and I. You're probably not constantly a liar. And you probably don't um, resist everybody that you deal with. But because of the way you feel about the police, you felt a little bit like, oh, or you were fearful or whatever. Your ability to listen and cooperate was diminished. That could have occurred on the same side with the police, right? And so you, when police officers make these arrests, they make these arrests. And what the Long Beach City, City Prosecutor has done in, in connection with some of the different laws that exist is most people that are arrested for resisting arrest um, aren't getting a long jail sentence for their first offense, right? Um, what the city prosecutor has done is, the, is he has identified people that um, could do community service and their case may be dismissed before the, before the plea, before the court trials. They do community service and they are able to make their case go away. Well, he's strengthened that by putting them through a training. And that training he puts them through is WISM 148, 148 being the penal code for resisting arrest. Mm -hmm. And WISM 148 allows people to come into the room and discuss their cases, reevaluate the, the traumatic instance that they had, and then go through how they could have done it differently. What could have been done differently before, during, and after to change the outcome? Because positive reactions to events build positive outcomes, and that's the E plus R equals O message. So that E plus R equals O message, these positive reactions to events building positive outcomes allows for these people to come out and make a difference in their community. Not only see that they need to cooperate with the police, but build the leadership skills to continue to make a difference in their community. I have not told our board of directors that I'm going to expose this. So this, it might get me into trouble, but tomorrow, one of the people that will be volunteering for us at the event is a person who got into a halfway violent incident with the Long Beach Police Department and was, resist, res, was, was arrested for resisting arrest, went through our program, vowed never to, never to have this incident with the police again. They didn't have any criminal history. This was their first deal. And they will be volunteering for our organization tomorrow for free because this person cares that much about police community relations to be able to say, you know what, I'll go surround myself with police officers and surround myself with those that like police officers. Because unfortunately, people that don't like police probably aren't showing up tomorrow. That's that's the unfortunate truth. Well, who knows now after this conversation and everything that you've enlightened <laughs> us. And actually, really, truly, even for myself, it's been fascinating Thank to listen you. There's to you. Because one more stat. Go oh, tell me. Okay. All right, here's the last stat. The last stat is we put 25 people through this resisting arrest diversion program. And all 25 of them have told us after the program, had they had the tools that they learned during this program, they would never have been arrested. And that's a 100% success rate for us. On top of that, we've followed these people, some of these folks for a two year period, and they've had no contact with the police, no negative contact and definitely no arrests. So it's a, it's a great positive to end on. And I really appreciate well, Sergeant that. Jason Lehman, it's definitely you've really shown the compassion that police can hold. It's really amazing that you have set up such an organization. Wisdom, W-I-Y-S-M dot org. Are there any other upcoming events or workshops that are happening that people could attend or look into? Sure. So we do part, we partner with the Long Beach Police, uh, Long Beach Police Department. And, in, and with the Long Beach Police Department, we put on something called Community Police Academies. And those Community Police Academies are run through a Long Beach Police curriculum. After somebody goes through those community police academies, they're then invited to come to a Why Do You Stop Me program, kind of like as a part two to the community police academy. So we would need people to consider signing up for the Long Beach Pol Community Police Academy, and they could find information at longbeach.gov forward slash police under the community police academy section. And then if they go through that pl community police academy, they can come to one of our programs. Another way is that they, if they were, if they uh, work at a school or attend a school, they can email us directly and ask us to bring a program to their school um, or to their after school program, parenting program, a bunch of different um, avenues. And all they have to do is email us at info 
at wism.org, info at wism.org, and we will be glad to help. Okay, well, amazing. Thank you so much for your service. Thank you so much for being here and also for talking to us. And also the event, if you want to get your tickets, head on over to wism.org, and it'll be a phenomenal event. You'll be listening to all the stories and seeing, actually seeing the artwork, which is impressive too. Um, well, thank you for all the service that you do for Long Beach here, Sergeant Jason Lehman. Thank you so much. <laughs>